Hello and welcome to the 47 Minutes of Heaven called the D-Home Baseball Podcast. I am your host, Michael Patrick. <laughs> Tonight's episode brought to us by our good friends at S2 Cognition. S2 Cognition delivers a revolutionary approach to helping athletes understand how in-game decisions impact their performance from youth levels all the way to the pros. Call S2, get a, an assessment on what kind of swing decisions you're making as a softball player or a baseball player. Uh, you will not regret it. Awesome stuff. I want to also say thank you to Pitch Logic, the system used by players, coaches, scouts, and instructors at all levels of play, from youth leagues to the big leagues. Easy to use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features used at the highest level of our sport. See pitchlogic.com for more information. Uh, tonight, I am joined by the two gentlemen whose eardrums I just blew out with my intro. That would be Fitty Barrels, the great Aaron J. Fit, and Kendall J. Rogers. Gentlemen, good evening. Sorry about your ear your bells there. Good evening, okay. Michael. That wasn't too bad. I just, Kendall, first pitch of the game, I want to come in hot. I want to establish, what, what is it, announce my presence with authority? Yeah, man. Yeah, you want to you want to show plus let's make it? You're not going to back down? That's right. I, I, I feel like you you evaluate my bar fight meter reading from the first pitch, and so I wanted you to, uh, yeah. Did you get some grass stains before the pod? <laughs> no. Just for old time's sake? I did. I think I shared that with you. I did have a scout. Uh, a scout who will go unnamed was at a game that will go unnamed, and he had he was very critical of the third base coaches in said game's lack of hustle from the dugout to the third base box. And and just to zing me a little bit, he said, hey, I'm not asking people to slide into the box, but could I at least get a jog? And I yeah. thought it was very fair. You know, the, the scouts are coming in hot on the text messages this week. So there was another scout who I don't even know whose name it was, so I, I, I guess he'll remain nameless. But he was texting Cypher, giving me a hard time for botching a couple of things in the Nerdcast last week. <laughs> and I want to I get out in front of this story, guys. Listen, I owe, I owe you an apology, <laughs> Columbia Lions. Apparently, I called them the Bears, which is outrageous. <laughs> Uh, uh niagara i owe you an apology did i, I apparently uh, you know what Weber i appreciate what what i appreciate about this is that somebody's giving you a hard time but nobody points out the fact that i literally just forgot that we talked about virginia tech for five minutes <laughs> yeah yeah week. like two seconds Bruins later, in the pot awesome. in the nerd cast we talked uh we we went through like the top 16 c's and hosting all that and I was like, hey, have we talked to our virginia tech <laughs> and, and aaron's like dude we just talked about them for like four or five minutes so, oh, you know, I'm one of those people, dude. It's like, you know, I got told first nerd cast. Yeah. I'm first, researching a little bit. Like, I'm, I'm zoned in, bro. First nerd cast of the year, Kendall. Yeah. There's no, we're not making we, we all, no valuations. excuse to call them the Columbia Bears, though. I mean, that's or, just or the, lack of respect. The Niagara Purple, a Purple Ace is not acceptable. Also. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, it's just especially, so. so and, Especially the Cypher as a former Purple Ace right. head coach, right? So, so you know, hat, you know, hats off, apologies uh, all around. Uh, I just want to say we're going to get better. You know, it's uh, uh, like you said, first nerd cast of the year. Everyone was rusty except for Mark, who's never rusty. I mean, never rusty. Pros, pro. I'm like, hey, the rest of them. I, I will. Yeah, I will say this. Uh, congrats to Brett Beretti. He became the, the all-time wins leader at Columbia over the weekend. He's done a really nice job there. He's awesome. You know, that's another one of the guys from the Davidson. Dick Cook coaching tree. Yeah. Really? Chris Pollard, okay. Brett Beretti, Mick Aoki, Pete Hughes. I mean, they pretty, pretty decent. Yeah, right? I'd say. Like, How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, yeah. and if and if you know Dick Cook, it's not a surprise. He's just such a yeah. such a such a classic baseball man and a, just a wonderful man to begin with. But uh, you know, he just he, the way he anyway, nothing He's but respect for, for coach for Cook. <laughs> He talked about getting into broadcasting, and even though yeah. that could hurt my my, like I don't know why I would be inviting competition. But as a college baseball fan, he's awesome. Like he'd be a great broadcaster. I think I'd love to listen to him talk yeah, about a college agree. baseball game. So, um, and who will forget him taking twenty seventeen Davidson to a super regional with like four scholarships? Yeah. And taking um, down a, a really loaded North Carolina team on yeah. the road. I think they were top eight. Seed and they played and, well in the super. Like yeah, they yeah. played bad against. They, it wasn't. It wasn't like they played. You know, light like lights out against North yeah. Carolina and just threw in the towel. Like they looked pretty good the next weekend. Yeah. Yeah. They catch an infield pop up. By was the way, the Friday starter for that team. The, that literally he was going to like pharmacy school. Duran Olinger. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes. Good pull. He did like eight hundred pitches in two weeks. And then oh he like God. shelled his pharmacy school plans, like because he got an offer to play pro ball. I think with the Red yeah, Sox, yeah, maybe. Yeah, and yeah. he's like, oh, I'm gonna go out and play. You know, I don't think that worked out. But hopefully, he went back to pharmacy school. <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm sure he did. If he, it, during a linger, if you're listening, call me. I work for a pharmacy. We could use you. Yeah. Um, so very good. Boys, let me ask you a trivia question. 
uh, to start. Charlie Condon leads the country in home runs with 20. Do you know how many teams? There are approximately 305 teams in Division One baseball. So I'm asking you to make a guess. Do you know how many teams Charlie Condon has more home runs than? So, so, so Chris Bryant in 2013, which was you know a crazy yeah. era, he out homered 226 <laughs> Division One teams. He had 31 <laughs> home runs. He out homered 226 teams. So Charlie Condon's not doing that. I'll give you a hint. But it is pretty remarkable. So Charlie Condon, as we sit here, today is Monday, April 8th. He has 20 home runs. How many Division I baseball teams is that more than? 25. Kendall? Uh, 87. Gosh, split the middle, boys. 58. Okay. Charlie Condon, Chucky Ball game, is out homered 58 teams so far. That is, that is amazing. Yeah. That is I mean, incredible. Yeah. I, like, how many? It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, how many home runs do we think Chris Bryant would hit with today's ball and bat in his in his college years? Well, we'd have to get him in a different league too, right? Like he was in the WCC. That's yeah. a graveyard of a league. Like that. That's the other part of his record that's even more mind boggling. Like if he was in a power league, what, what would he have hit? Forty eight. I mean, it was like yeah, I mean, they, they, those parks are graveyards. You're right. Now, now their home park there. Fowler was was that's much a good more homer friendly. I mean, it's yeah, you know, of course, the short porch in right field. He had that oppo power. He took advantage of it, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you're right. Like it's <laughs> mostly graveyards in that league. Yep. Yeah, love it. Hey boys, let's let's walk around. Let's 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 work our way around the country. Um, somebody on somebody uh, tweeted at us about not giving the West Coast enough love, and I want to. So let's just do this. Let's go from west east. Let's start on the left coast. Yeah. And uh, that's how we read our words. We read from left to right. So let's let's address the country that way. Um, so I want to start with Irvine, Santa Barbara. And Irvine won the series. And um, it was, you know, the, the middle game was really tight. Santa Barbara won 5-4. It, it came down to the last pitch. Um, but Ir- Irvine outplayed Santa Barbara. They, they, they look good. What, any takeaways from that series? I, I can go third on this. I've got some takeaways, but go ahead. Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, in the in the, in the podcast last week, kind of previewing the weekend about, you know, how much respect we had for UCSB, even though they won one of those games. Uh, you know, Irvine controlled the other two games. Like, they pretty much dominated the rest of that series. So I thought that was really impressive considering, you know, the personnel that, that UCSB has. But, you know, Nick Pinto got them off to a really nice start. You know, Caden Kendall continues to hit at a really high level. And the thing I like about UCI, man, is they, they just seem really balanced. Like, you know, they, they may not have, you know, three guys in the week rotation, though, in 97. Uh, but they're all really solid arms. They've got solid bullpen arms. And they can obviously hit at a very high level. So uh, I'll let their club a lot. I, I don't care who you're playing. Uh, you know, being able to assemble that kind of record at the midseason marks is extremely impressive. And I think they're very dangerous. Because I think what happens here – is I think so many people look at the West and go, oh, well, you know, you know, the, the West is down for the most part. So, you know, yeah, UC Irvine, they're, they're probably just okay. I think they're one of those teams that's going to get in the postseason. It'll be such a different style, and they're so good. I think they're going to be a really difficult team to beat if they can get far enough to, to play some of these ACC, SEC schools. I think they're dangerous. And and I would agree that it's, it's a different style insofar as they take a ton of doses. Uh, Right, raw, uh, Kendall, uh, uh, Rooney, yes, rather, yeah, 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 it's a lot yeah. of it's a, it's a lot of hit by pitches, yeah, outstanding um, reference, and, and it's you know, and it's it's elite defense, and it's you know, they're they're gonna lay it down, and they, they do play yep. that 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 inside game, but also, I mean, it's just a team that has like real threats throughout. I mean, it's real hitters, you know, I and mean, maybe it's not like the 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 premium power so i guess yeah you know what you're right it's a different style because I, I was inclined to try to compare this to almost to like a like a stanford position player group from a couple years ago where it's like yeah they play mm-hmm. on the west coast but they have a ton of power they're, they're a very offensive team but this is this is an offensive team but it's not really a home run driven team so it's actually that's actually not a good parallel it, it is actually more of just an old school like high octane like glory days fullerton or even Glory Days Irvine kind of an offense. I, I think they can pressure you in a lot of different ways. Um, and they have guys that are just, you know, really legit hitters. I mean, like Caden Kendall's hitting you know, almost 450. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you got Woody Hedin, you got Anthony Martinez, who's a preseason All-American. You got, you know, my, my guy, Joe Oyama, who's just a st- 
just a he had a great game. weekend. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, I just, I, I totally agree with you. I think they're, they're really balanced and deep uh, offensively. They play great defense. You know, they throw strikes. They just are very fundamentally strong. They're just they're I think they're outstanding. I absolutely think there's a team that can get to Omaha. Well, and the other thing for me too, like, and this is, this will end up being a dilemma and then we might as well have this discussion real quick, just because it's going to come up down the road. But, you know, when you look at UC Irvine, you know, one of the chat questions today was about them and their ability to host. Right now, uh, their RPI is in the top 17. They're in great shape as of today. The problem is, is when you look at their remaining schedule, guys, I mean, RPI is 145, 240, 264, 110, 191, 175. You know, maintaining that, I mean, let's be honest, like that's going to be impossible. Uh, So I really think UCI, given what they've done so far this year, and given, you know, we, we talk about the eye test, right? Like the committee always talks about, well, they, you know, that, they look really good in the eye test. Like, I think they passed the eye test. I think they're one of those teams that I think it, as a committee, like you're going to have to evaluate differently than you do, let's say, an SEC team. Because, like, they've proven they're an elite team. Yet, when you look at the remaining opponents, like, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to evaluate them against those teams, you know, playing those teams. So, I think they're one of those clubs that could end. Up, they could be one of those outliers where they may have a 32 RPI and they end up being a top 16 seed. Especially if they're, you know, the, the chat question was if they're 48 and eight. I mean, if they're 48 and eight and they've done what they did in non-conference, to me, they should be a top 16. Yep. Agree. Yeah. yeah, and I worry. Like I'm, you know, this is going to be sour grapes, but I might as well just spill them. Like, I, I don't think the committee did a good job evaluating Irvine last year, you know, like, and I get it. The Big West was a mess, right? Like you have a team that wins the league that's not even eligible for the NCAA tournament. That's already a hard look for the league, right? Like it, it just got ugly, right? They had five teams, like super bunch at the top. They don't have a conference tournament. The Big West does not do itself any favors. Let's be clear there. Uh, in fairness to the committee. But Irvine last year was top 30 in scoring, top 30 in ERA. Um you know, they had the number one winning percentage on the road last year. They were eight and one versus Pac-12 teams. This, so so that team got snubbed. This year, it's every single at bat. We've said this before. It's every single at bat back from that team that was so good. Plus Woody Hadeen, who I think is going to be a top four round pick. This is a shortstop, 6'2", 190, switch hitter, having a big year. Joe Oyama was dominant in the Cape. This is a 5'7", left-handed hitter. who He went oppo bomb this weekend. Fitzy, he, he had a bomb to left center at Irvine, which is not a band box. You yeah, know, right. Caden Kendall, you mentioned, was a 10th round pick last year. He's yeah. the reigning Big West player of the year. Yeah. He returned. He looks like a Division II running back. Like, to your point, Kendall, Irvine is not our father's Big West team. Like, there's they're not six foot four, but they're not 120 pounds either. And, you know, Nick Pino is the active leader in career starts on the mound. And it's, you know, it, it is a left handed breaking ball. So, anyway, I don't want to overdose on Irvine, but I'm with you, Kendall. Like, committee if you're listening i know you're not you gotta dive deep on this team like you've got to sink your teeth in because there won't be a conference tournament again that's not until 2025 unfortunately well can i i mean i'll just go ahead and say it what what the committee did then the last year was just lazy i mean the fact that they all of a sudden lost what nine games against the top 50 in the last week and a half of the season and the committee like had no clue i mean that, that that was just lazy research let's be honest yeah, I, I I think again we're we're I don't want to relitigate it. We kind of are, yeah. but the committee got overwhelmed. I think that committee got overwhelmed. There was a lot of upsets at the end. They and they panicked and they just said RPI. Like RPI became the life raft, and I just I dread that. I just that's that's I, I hate that. But hey, let's do this. Let's go to the pack, as Jake Mintz would say. This I may miss this as much as anything about the Pac-12 that Jake Mintz can't call it the Packeronian 12 Not, anymore. Well. Well, no, exactly. Hey, real quick, I was going to, on the Big West. Yes. Uh, Runes, you called this, by the way. I want to give you a hat tip. And oh, no. I'll give Aaron credit for the weight call later in the podcast. But you, uh, Cal Poly, guys, is now 9-3 and three <laughs> in the Big <laughs> West. So, hashtag <laughs> resume <laughs> wrecker. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, gosh. We all think so highly of Larry Lee. Like, he's no the question. best. And, and that's I'm just stre- kidding, by the way. Yeah, no, we, but, but this has to be said. Like, the stretch they had – in like yeah. 2014, 15, when they're hosting all that stuff, like it, it, he's done incredible things at Cal Poly, but and and Larry Lee would even tell you, like, why are we so, why do we struggle so badly in the non-conference and then ruin the Big West? Like they do this, they've done this so many times. It's talk of oh my gosh. And this year's, and this year it's like, well, I mean, part of it is okay. And they schedule, they tend to schedule pretty aggressively. I mean, they went to Texas for three games, they got swept. They didn't score a run in those three games. <laughs> yeah. though. Like. 
That's hard uh, to do. And it's not they, like they, te- it's not like Texas yeah. pitching staff is you know the but, Justin Verlander and company. But yeah, and they they had, they played Utah, who's having a good year. They lost two out of three at home. They played Missouri to open the year. Who maybe we need to start taking Missouri more seriously. I don't know about that. Uh, I think losing two out of three to Missouri at home is is not a good look. Um, mm-hmm. But like I'm going to give Pauly credit since then. I mean, gosh, they're they're sitting at 18 and 12 overall now. So not yeah. only have they done well in the in the league, yeah. but I mean, like they were in that deep hole. They were what two and eight or something to start the year, and since then there's there's something like 16 and yeah. four. I mean, you know, they're they're playing a lot better, and so you know their RPI is not going to get there at large wise. They're still like outside the top 100. That's not going to happen, but um, it, it, you're right, though. I mean, you, it's kind of exactly like you said when they started the year rough and then they started to win, and you're like, you're, they're going to do it again. They're going to finish like yeah. second place in the league and like squeeze somebody else out of regional because they're not going to get in as an at large. From a program standpoint, I'd say this it does feel like they're back to themselves a little bit. Like the last couple of years have felt like legitimate since Brooks, since Brooks Lee and Drew yeah. Thorpe left, they felt legitimately down. Like they felt like yeah. not themselves. This feels like more of a legit, like this feels like the Cal Poly program that I'm that we're more familiar with. But hey, let's go to the Pac 12 boys. So Oregon State swept Arizona State. A- Arizona State and Cal are like, like, I mean, we're in real trouble right now. And I like it's it's a little mystifying because like I, I think we know what the holes on those two teams are, but they're gonna have players drafted in prominent positions, I think. Um, and so, but you know, like it's it's more than the draft. Let, let me say this and you guys tell me what you think. Oregon State is the known commodity. I think Oregon is Kendall, you were the first on this bus. Like Oregon is the second best team in that league. And they're like, that's a postseason team. I like they've not lost a Pac 12 yeah. series. Yeah, they're I like good. Look. Yeah. Yeah, no, I like their look. I thought, you know, the weekend I saw them. Granted, it was a long time ago, it was opening weekend, but you know, you know, Grayson Grinzel was a really nice pitcher for them. Um, you know, they had some velocity out of the bullpen. Uh, was it Brock Moore, right? Yeah, I mean, he was up to like 98, yeah. 99 out of the bullpen. Uh, the weekend I saw them. So they have some really nice options. They've got some physicality in the middle of that lineup. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, I like their club. And, and again, I, I'm a little bit biased because I think he's, he's just a really good coach. But, like, in Waz, I trust. Like, I just kind of feel like Oregon's always going to find a way. And so, you know, I'm, I'm buying stock in those guys. You know, Arizona, fellas, is 10-5 and five now in the league. Yeah. Uh, I wanted, Did they end up sweeping Stanford today? They, they – uh... They did win today, yes. 12-1. to Eight one. wins non, in a row. Oh, my gosh. Not, non-conference uh, Pac-12 Pac game. Yeah, but, and you saw yeah. them earlier this year. Yeah, and and, and so this, here's my, my challenge I'm going to throw. It's because I agree with you guys that Oregon's sure. a regional team and a team that could win a regional like they did last year. Uh, but Arizona, to me, I think is going to wind up being the number two team in the league. Uh, I think we're seeing it now. It's coming together. And, and, and the reason for that is because their pitching is a separator. In, in, in a year when nobody basically has pitching, Arizona's got three guys that I, I, I really trust, you know, with Jackson Kent and, and, and Cam Walty and, and, and Clark Candiotti. I like the way that they can mix and match in their bullpen, a lot of different looks, but I mean, like those three starters have stuff and like they're physical and they can give you extended innings. I mean, it's not like the most offensive team, but I mean, like they got nice pieces. Certainly Mason white, I think is one of the best players in the West coast. Um, you know, Brandon Summerhill is super physical. I mean, they, they've got some guys uh, who can string things together. And, and it felt like early in the year, they were just kind of chip Hale said it in Frisco they're just trying to trying to learn to play winning baseball. They're just not playing winning baseball that time, but like, the pieces were there and it felt like you've got the right guy there to teach them how to play winning baseball. Like that's, that's, you know, that's another like old school ball coach, man, like chip Hill, give me that guy. If like, all we got to do is like p- string a few things together and like learn how to win. Like, yes. You know, if we got the personnel, then I think, I think he'll take care of the next piece, you know, the intangibles piece, the winning piece. And we're seeing it now. Like I said, they won eight in a row. They're suddenly they're, they're, they're eight. Uh, I'm sorry. They're, uh, 11 and five in the league and 18 and 13 overall. I mean, like they're surging, they're kind of in at large territory. And I, I kind of think they wind up maybe being the number two team in the league. And I find it interesting that, you know, when you, when you talk about Arizona, the first thing you talk about is their pitching. Cause historically, like when you think of Arizona, okay. you think of offense. Yeah. Yep. Kevin Vance, man. Hey, Chip Hale. I, I was, really you know, like I, I can, I, I needed to take, I needed to jump on the grenade for us. Like I picked Arizona to finish ninth in the league that was not a good pick. However, you know who else picked Arizona finished ninth in the league? The coaches. Yeah. Their peers thought they were going to finish ninth. And, you know, it's, but 
ch- even when I wrote that in the fall report and the preview, I did try to go out of my way to say that Chip Hale's vision for the program is really on point. Like he basically says, we understand we're in a hitter's park and we want to be Wake Forest West. And so we hired Kevin Vance and we hired a stats guy and we're pumping mo- money into like the real technology. And I mean, you know, Kevin Vance has done a nice job with the staff. And that's, you know, it's interesting too, because it's a hitter's park, but it's not a Homer dome. You know, it's no. like a doubles and triples and it's like super fast Big and all gaps. that fast, yeah, fast surface and big gaps. And like, you know, you can, you it's certainly an offensive yard, but not because, so like, I think if you can keep the ball in the park, <laughs> maybe that gives you an advantage, you know, maybe you can build a staff around that. And they got yeah. some spin rate guys pitch up in the zone and, you know, and they can, they got variety of their staff. Actually, they got sinker ball guys too, but um, I, I like just like the way their, their, their staff is constructed. Yep. Yeah. Th- you know, the other team in the pack 12 guys we need to talk about is Utah. Uh, obviously, Hendo's done a great job there, seven and five in the pack, twenty-one to nine. You know, we talked about the, you know, we, we've talked about RPIs a little bit, sitting at a forty RPI. I mean, they would be in as of today, and you know, they've done a really nice job with with Kai Roberts kind of leading that offense. Yeah, what a beast that guy is, huh, Runes? Yeah, I mean, it, he's fun too. Like, you know, I've said this before on the pod. Ryan Roberts, his dad was the coach at BYU or assistant coach at BYU for a long time. Good oh, guy. Yeah. Like, and and Kai Roberts has been famous f- since he's been there, and it's really come together now. And I just the problem for the Pac-12 is going to be like a team like USC is playing out of their like Andy Stankwitz and that staff deserve a lot of credit. I thought this was a completely lost season. They were, you know, no field and they were terrible early and they are just breaking hearts right now. Like you, you better hope you've already played USC because they yeah. they have found it. And but That's it's going to be question. too late for them. Right. Like I think they've too much. They took on too much water early, probably it, for themselves. It's Cal Poly of the pack, basically. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's you know, they're they're still they're still under 500, though. They're 15 and 16. Yeah. Uh, overall, but they're nine and five in the league and they're surging uh, RPI at 98. It just, it feels like yeah. it's unlikely to get there, but you never know. And they have a conference tournament. So they, they also you know, have that path. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the, the last comment I would make on the pack is this, it's mystifying to me to see UCLA. Actually, it's like bizarre to look at the standings and see UCLA sitting in ninth place with a 151 RPI. Like that's unbelievable. Yeah, they're, they're it's just wild. Hey, let's put to finish the the pack. Sure. I think the Beavs are going to go on a run right now. Th- this is the healthiest they've been. Trent Caraway's supposed to be back soon. Aiden May's back, and he's starting to build pitch count. Um, uh, Brady Casper, their outfielder, I think they're getting him back soon. Um, Micah McDowell missed some time, but uh, it's it doesn't yeah. sound like any of these injuries. Uh, Leif Palmer right. is back, the the big freshman reliever. So, yeah. Oregon State has is is starting to get healthy and they were already doing just fine. Yeah, I was going to say, look at, yeah. look at Rune's making a bold statement saying the 26 and yeah. four teams about to make a run. Oh, wow. Hey, yeah. right. hey Rune's keeping, uh, keeping on this Travis Bazana guy. He's got a chance to really be hot down the stretch. <laughs> Can you imagine like this, this dude, like every time Oregon States up one, nothing every game, right? Like he leads off every game with a lead off home run. It's Can crazy. I throw something at you just to build yes. on that? Because somebody asked a great question in the chat today. Uh, if you look at the numbers now, Bazana and Condon now have basically the same OPS. Uh, Bazana has actually ticked ahead in, in war. They're like, you know, but by, by like 0.01, they're like back to back in war. They're basically tied there. But Bazana gives you that, you know, defensive value plays a premium position, plays it really well. Uh, he gives you the speed stuff. It, the question was, has Bazana passed Condon as the favorite for the Golden Spikes award? He doesn't play in the SEC though. Yeah, but, I think I think I think um, it would be for me. I mean, he 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 plays for a national championship contender, and I know that's not really fair to Charlie, but I mean, it matters. It helps, I yeah. think. D- yeah, I it's it's interesting, like because just because Condon's so physically imp- imposing, but do you, have you guys looked? So so Bazana has thirty seven walks. He has thirteen strikeouts. Thirty seven to thirteen. And he's got 17 homers. He's, you know, I mean, like, that's the thing is like, everyone's made such a big deal. Charlie's got all these home runs. Charlie's got 20. bazana has got 17. He's right there. You know, it's right, like right. even in that category. Yeah. yeah. I and think he's it's playing a great different point. elements too. Like he's, you know, I saw, was it like last week I was, I was watching a little bit of an Oregon state game and they were playing in like 45 degree weather and yeah. in like late March with yeah. rain and, and he's still hitting, hitting bombs. Yeah. And he plays in the pack and Conan plays in the SEC where every ballpark's a homer dome. And the pack, not so much. Like there aren't yeah. there aren't really yeah. homer domes yeah. out west. Yeah. 
It's crazy. And I think I think um, we'll go to the Big 12 next. But I think with with Oregon State, this is what I would just say. They've been really good. And I think they're about to go find another gear as they get their real team back. And yeah, yeah. you're right. No, that's I, honest. I, I do actually. I was, I was teasing you, but I, I do agree yeah. with you. Like, that's the funny thing is they've had this incredible season. And it's, you're right. Like, they, they were without, you know, their best pitcher for a while there. Uh, McDowell, you know, as you mentioned, like he's had a huge yeah. year, like a monster year. And he was very good last year and he's taken to a different level. And so you're know, getting him healthy again. I mean, you're, you're totally right. Like, you know, they, they've been able to, to, to kind of hold it together even without a lot of their key pieces. And, and it kind of feels like wake forest where it's like, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of on that verge now of being who that we thought they would really be. And it's just a, yeah. in Oregon state's case, they've just been so dominant that it hasn't really mattered for the most part. Under. 100%. So the Big 12, I said to Coach mm-hmm. Farron, our good friend Coach Farron today, I said to him, the Big 12 standings, they, the police officers should use these standings as a field sobriety test. Like, you you can't look at these standings and then not lose your balance. Like You, know, is, what it, you know what it reminds me of, Runes? It reminds me of the Frank Drebin where he's outside the exploding building going, <laughs> there's nothing to see here. Move yes. along. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Going off in the background. Yes. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. You're exactly <laughs> right, Kettle. That's the perfect gif for these standings. I don't know. So Oklahoma State won a big series at Oklahoma or versus Oklahoma at home. We ranked them. UCF keeps doing their thing. Hilarious. You know, like UCF's got a fun team. Texas Tech has sneakily won six in a row, and they are going to Fort Worth. And TCU is reeling right now. Um, I, I If you had told me before the season, Houston and TCU would be 12th and 13th in that league. I would tell you to put the cough syrup down. I don't know what's going on in this league. Uh, Kendall, if you want to start us, make some sense of this. Uh, well, uh, there's not a lot of sense to make of it. You know, I'll say this. So we could talk about a lot of things. I mean, TCU, the biggest question with them right now is just offensively. Uh, I mean, they were hitting 193 in the Big 12 a couple of weeks ago. Hey, they're at least hitting 220 now. I mean, that's not much better. But, I mean, when you're hitting 220 – in league, like your pitching has to be amazing to win games against good teams. So that's been an issue. Uh, Kansas, guys, is a team I'm a little concerned about. Uh, you know, they're now seven and eight. They're down to 82 in the RPI. You know, I still like their club, but I'll be curious to see how they kind of finish things out the second half. You know, Jordan Bishel's done a really nice job at Cincinnati. Guys, they're seven and five. They're mm-hmm. they're in a four way tie for a third place in the Big Twelve. Um, you know, Texas Tech. You know. Who, who knows what to expect from them? I feel like one weekend they're impressive. The next weekend it's brutal. But the two clubs, I tell you what, that I really like the second half of the season, West Virginia and Oklahoma State. I think Oklahoma State, get, you know, I wouldn't say lucky is the right word, but I think they caught West Virginia at a really good time. They beat them two out of three in Morgantown the week before Weatherholt returned. I'll tell you what, what you know, West Virginia, they just had a different feeling about them over the weekend against Kansas. They were really yeah. clutch. JJ was really clutch. And so West Virginia and Oklahoma State, guys, are the two teams that are really front of mind for me as we head down the back stretch of you know the season. Yeah, and and you know, that was a road series too for West Virginia to go out there and sweep. Yeah. Uh they get the instant jolt with Weather Holt the first game back. He hits the the walk-off double, I think. He had three hits or something that game. I mean, you know, it's yeah. just it, it kind of, you know this is maybe the best player in America heading into the year. Right. And, and it's like, you hadn't had him for the entire first half. And all of a sudden you get the, you, you kind of hold on for dear life. And, you know, obviously they have other good players, like they're, they're good enough to hold on, but like now you're, you're, I mean, you're tied for first place in the league and you just got maybe the most talented player in the country back, you know, with all due respect to Condon and Bazana, like a healthy weather holds right there with them, you know? Um, and, and so, yeah, it's super exciting, and and you know, I, the pitching. I mean, you know, you got Aiden Major, and, and the, the dude who pitched Saturday went the distance. Uh, uh, Clark, right there, Clark. Clark. Yeah. I mean, like a three hit shutout. Hello, uh, you got my attention. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm going up there this weekend for that UCF series, uh, a series that you know was not really on my travel calendar a month ago. Uh, but UCF's in the top twenty five. I don't know. I'm. I'm. Sh- I'm. Just, I know shamefully little about this team. Like, as I've got something are. for you on UCF. Please, Fitzy. Please. So, so um, they're fielding 980. Like they 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 defend at a really high level. They're um, the other thing. Lex Bodicker. It's not Bodicker. Lex yeah. Bodicker. He's actually a third baseman outfielder. And and Rich Wallace mentioned that he asked him to play first base this year. 
because that was the need for the team. So they end up with this like incredibly athletic first baseman. They have four relievers. It kind of reminds me of USC last year. They have their best arms are their four relievers at the yeah. end. And so again, like they're just playing very efficient. Yeah. Well, they, they've got older guys runes, you know, yeah. Dom Castellano has been there for a couple of years. You know, Chase Santala feels like he's been there for like a decade. You know, he's still there. So they've got guys other bullpen, you know, if their starter gets in trouble, they can give them some serious length and guys with a lot of experience. Um, hey, I was going to go back to Oklahoma State real quick, just kind of give you a since we were talking about, you know, names with UCF. Let me give you a name for Oklahoma State real quick. Uh, Zach Earhart, uh, you know, Fitzy just talked about him last weekend, guys. All thick guys. He had a huge weekend against Oklahoma. Had a couple of homers against uh, the Sooners. Guys, he's now hitting 531 with a 1.439 OPS in conference play. Yeah. Uh, that'll play. Don't yeah, we, we talked about heading into the weekend, like you said on the pod, yeah. like he was had a huge weekend the week before too, and then he followed it up. Like that's a, I mean, that's a difference making player. We've been waiting for it, mm -hmm. and it's come. Yeah. So let's. So I'll, here's here's my phrase for the Big Twelve, and then we're going to move on. Stay tuned because there are ten yeah. games, ten teams, ten of the thirteen teams are within three games of first place. That's a weekend, and yeah, there's a lot of teams that ain't done yet. They ain't done yet. The, the, the Big 12 is is Marcus Peters' favorite baseball league, no question about it. And, uh, you know, TCU is is 12th, and they would be an at-large team right now, right? They're 39 no. in the RPI. It would, uh, it would not be. minus uh, the, RP, 10, the RPI, but, uh, probably not at 5 and 10. But you no. Well, you know, but they're not going to – if they finish 5 and 10, they're, they're, I'm saying their RPI they're, would be an at-large. RPI 20 is and 11. There. Yeah, they're 20 yeah, and 11. But, but, but like 12th place in a – 13 team yeah. league or whatever it well, is. Well, like. they can't they can't stay there, but the yeah. they're out their non-conference well, resume what is at large. I'm gonna ask you right now. Will TCU make a regional? Yes or no? Are they done or are they done yet or not? Because I am very nervous. Like five and ten getting swept by Cincinnati. I'm ready to I'm ready to jump ship. And you're in a bad tight. if you're TCU, you're in a really bad spot if you lose that series this weekend. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's gonna this, be hard because in because in a league like this where it seems like you know, other than maybe Baylor, although we sit there and say Baylor, but I mean, they're ahead in the standings of BYU, TCU, and U of H. But I mean, in a league where it just seems like just a mixed bag of teams, I mean, you can't expect to go from six and 12 yeah. and make up that ground. So, so I ask you again, will they make a regional? Yes or no? My answer is no. I'll go with yes. I'm going to go no. I don't have a good I, – I, I'm going to go no, but, Kendall, what you said a second ago is where my head's at. This is like – this weekend is not optional for TCU. They can't lose this weekend. Like, they, they're, they've – all their mulligans, Fitzy, if I could use the golf terminology, all the mulligans have been spent for TCU right now. I really feel that way. So, yep. hey, let's let's do – um. We'll, we'll save some of the 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 mid-major stuff at the end There's because there's some interesting stuff. Let's do the SEC. Um. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Vandy wins that series at LSU. Kentucky is 11 and 1 in the league. You know, AM, I'm personally disappointed that AM didn't win that game three. Like, I, I'm not nervous about AM, but I'm, I don't understand why AM is like, like, they're awesome, but like, how do you not sweep South Carolina when South Carolina is vulnerable? Like, that, I'm, I'm just waiting for AM to show me one more gear. Maybe I'm holding them to too high of a standard, but that felt like a very, well, it was on the road. I'll, yeah. The I mean, I'll say thing. this about AM is I didn't think they played very well in that series, in that, that final game. And it was like South Carolina was holding on for dear life. So, like, if, if you don't play well and, a, and the home team is holding on for dear life in the SEC not to get swept, I, I think that means you're pretty good. And no, that's I mean, my point, Kendall. They give are Matthew good. Becker like, credit. Like Matthew Be yeah. Becker and Garrett Ganey were actually really good on the mound. I I, I was not expecting that from Becker. And I he just really like, kept them off balance with his off speed stuff. Yeah, and and South Carolina is better than I'm giving him credit for. My point is that for I look at A and M and I think yeah. you should be 11 and one in the SEC. Like you should be one of those teams. I know that they've played Florida, which is confusing, and they've played Mississippi State, and and I get that, but it's like. I feel like AM's talent is better than eight and four in the league. And again, that could just be me holding them too too yeah. high of a standard. Yeah, I I I uh I agree with you, but also I just think you have to look at the schedules. Like, you know, if yeah. they play Kentucky schedule, um, you know, again, not that Kentucky's played nobody, like, you know, sweeping uh, Alabama is is loud, you know, and holding Alabama to three runs in three games. That's loud to me. I mean, I, that's that's where I want to go next. 
I mean, like as much as we've talked about Kentucky schedules, the first three weeks were Georgia, Missouri, and Ole Miss, which, which seemed favorable. This weekend, they came out and, and really showed me something. And not, you know, again, I don't think Alabama's elite. I do like their club. Um, I'm conf- it's another team that I'm a little bit confused by. I feel like that team should be better than than four and eight in the league. <laughs> Didn't see that coming. Uh, don't know why Ben Hess isn't more dominant or dominant at all. I don't know why he's not better with, 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 with his stuff and with his track mm. record. But, I mean, Trey Poozer has just gone out there and been a dude. Uh, I think Joe – is it Joe mentioned it in the, on the pod last week about or, – or maybe in our group chat – about Travis Smith maybe just being a really good fit at that back end role. Yeah. Uh, you know, they tried to kind of pigeonhole him into that, or not pigeonhole him. They tried to make him that that Friday guy. And now that he's he's back and kind of, you know, giving them some security blanket there at the back end. I like that. Uh yeah. I think that makes them even better. And and it's just another team that's almost like is it an Irvine-ish kind of a like position player group and style of play as far as like they just have a lot of guys that are like they can hit, you know, like just get guys hit for average, put ball in play, they move runners. They they can run a little bit. I mean, maybe they're more. I don't know. I mean, it's it's. Are they they're like pretty, the Irvine yeah, like of, of the SEC? Yeah, they're not trying to hit home runs, but they're pretty athletic and physical, right? Like they're yeah, they know yeah, who they like, are. Yeah, yeah, and they're not they're not lightweights by any stretch. Here here's this. I'll give you three three stats on Kentucky real quick. They outscored Georgia in a in a series sweep thirty five seventeen. They outscored Alabama in a series sweep, 23-3. They went on the road and outscored Ole Miss 37-13. to I mean, that's extremely impressive. Yep. And I just and, think Kentucky's one of those teams where the their their pressure, like there's there's a couple ways to have a crooked crooked number, right? Like power, but other times it's pressure and the other team just caves. And I feel like that's Kentucky's offense. It's not outrageous stolen bases and those types of things, but like every pitch is contested. They're not giving yeah. away at bats, and they they're everything is in play. It's a lot to defend, and you're right, Fitzy, just to put a bow on that. I watched the end of one of those Alabama games, and Travis Smith, whose numbers were pretty pedestrian, what I saw him close with was vicious. It was 96 with a outrageous slider, and like if you're throwing him in the eighth and ninth inning, good night. Like that's unhittable stuff one one time through. And and Kendall talked about how much you know they outscored Georgia, for instance, in a series sweep. Well, we talked about Chuck Condon out homering teams. He's got twenty. Kentucky's only got thirty four homers as a team. Mm-hmm. Chuck's got twenty, and okay. Kentucky just ran him off. You know, ran him off the field in that series. Like that really? just shows you. Like it, it's it's so refreshing. Frankly, I, I, I'm I'm all in on this Kentucky team now. I've decided it's refreshing to see it. Teams like Irvine and Kentucky that just play baseball to just try to bash you over the sky. I'm tired of that style of baseball. This is great. This is great for the game. All hail Kentucky. Yo, old man screaming at clouds over here. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, hey. Can, can I give you, you know, we talked about TCU of the Big 12. Can, can I make a proclamation? Oh, uh, Alabama will not be in the postseason. Here's Alabama's remaining schedule, gentlemen. <laughs> Arkansas, Texas A&M. No likey. At Ole Miss, at Mississippi State, at Auburn, LSU. They're not making the postseason. Yeah, that's they're gonna that's have to play tough. better if they keep playing uh, the way they're playing. You're right. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm gonna say they find a way, but I, I'm. I'm less convicted than I used to be. Maybe I'm taking the position you took on TCU. I just, I'm not ready to jump ship on this one. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, like I hate to doubt Rob Vaughn. I mean, the the resume speaks for itself. I mean, that's a that is a murderer's row. Other than Maybe, you know, I, I, you can't say LSU anymore. Other than LSU Ole Miss, that's that's a very difficult finish. And then you have to go on the road and face Auburn, who at that that stage in the game, Auburn's going to be in a mess with situation as well. But you at know, least they've I, got they've got Arkansas and A&M at home. And so, yeah. you know, I mean, maybe you can steal a series You need to steal one of those. Yeah. No. I'm not – boys, I'll, I'll say this. I'm not ready to walk away from LSU mm-hmm. or the Gators, but I'm gravely concerned about both. I, I re-watched – Jack Caglione start all 14 hitters of it the other day or yesterday. And I just couldn't believe Missouri had seven hits off Jack Caglione. So I want to, <laughs> I want to, I want to put some context to that. It was two pop-ups that should have been caught. And, and we all get that my um, Missouri is a tough place to play like wind and it's freezing and, you know, like, and Florida definitely had the look of what time's our flight. Like it, they did not look by day three. They looked like, wow, where, where are we? Um, Two pop-ups that were not caught, an infield single that absolutely, you know, Colby Shelton, that should have been an out. 
um, two flares, and then two legit line drives. I, I would just say this. I said it to you guys in our chat. Florida's defense was appallingly bad. I had no idea. They did not, you know, uh, um, Garrison, is it Tanner Garrison? Is that how you say it? He, he really struggled to catch CAGs. Um, they, the, the, the defense was terrible. Like it was below average at almost every position. I don't think that's who they are always, but it was really concerning. And I get it. Like CAGs is pitching, not playing first base. And that's an immediate downgrade for their defense. But I, uh, I, I'm I, I'm worried about Florida's style of play. It's like swinging out of their shoes, power dependent, not good defense. I'm worried about LSU's just kind of mojo. They just they just felt out. They don't, of, they, they don't look like they're in a great spot. No, they don't look connected at all. It's it's, it's um yeah, it's weird. They just they're too well, talented for this. They've got too many guys who with national championship pedigrees. Yes, there are other new guys that they had to blend in, but I don't get it. I don't get why they're, they're, the talent. I mean, the talent is still really good. I know they're not as good as last year. Like that was a super team, but like and this is inexplicable a little bit to me. I yeah. will say this: I think I'm yeah. more confident in Florida figuring things out than I am LSU. Really? Because at least Florida's done it. Or I mean, it, like yeah, they kind of held on for dear life in the series finale against A&M, but they still won the series. They held on for dear life against you know Mississippi State. Well, they had to come back on Mississippi State late. They win that series, so they they I mean they've at least beaten some really good teams yeah. in conference. And and LSU's lost all four of its series. You're right. Yeah. Granted, it's not an easy schedule. You know, at Mississippi State versus Florida, at Arkansas versus Vandy to start the league. Now they got at Tennessee. So I mean, like, <laughs> it's it's it feels like it feels like it's it's now or never for LSU, doesn't it? Like, isn't this a must win for them at Tennessee? I mean, yeah, it, 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 I'll I'll be fascinated because it, like it just it just feels like one of those series that like everybody's writing LSU off. They go in and play like world beaters in Knoxville, but yeah. man, I don't know if I see it with this team. Who was saying it? Know. Somebody said today in our chat. I, I can't remember, but they said that it's basically last year's Tennessee team is going to play this year's Tennessee team, right? Like because last year Tennessee was yeah. five and ten, and LSU, you know, is three and nine in the league right now, and. Yeah. Um, anyway, very interesting. There is not a team in the world that would love to put LSU of its misery more than Tennessee, though. I can promise you that. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's the best part about the SEC is just the, the <laughs> you know, all the ang- it, it, the league is just so hypercharged. It's just amazing. Um, boys, let's do the ACC. Yeah. So, um, Fitzy, Hashtag deep day. Yeah, like we are back, baby, right? Like deep day. We'll th- tap, they the, were... tap the brakes on that. I mean, come no. on now. No, we're back. One weekend. Deeks big progress. Back. Aaron, I'll give you the floor, but big progress, but not back just yet. No, they're back. They're back. Hey, you can be late if you want to be late. That's fine. You're, That's I mean, right. you're already late. Listen, you've already missed the bus. The bus is gone, I'm a true, Kendall. I'm a, I'm a true Pull out of the parking Aaron. lot. You know, we're on our way to <laughs> – where are we going? Six Flags? Where are we going on this bus? Uh, Wherever. Listen, they're, they're back. And, and, and again, you know, I was I was down on them for a while there in the first half, and I was said I was really worried about them, but – they they weren't the same team now. Now all of a sudden, you throw a healthy Nick Kurtz back in the mix. You, you, you throw a, he- a healthy Merrick Houston back in the mix. Healthy and hot Nick Kurtz, by the way. Yes, if, exactly. All of a sudden, he's Kurtz again. That's such a huge piece. That's just such a huge, huge thing because he was not really he was out of sorts the first you know before he got hurt early in the year. Um, you know, you, you throw a, a healthy Cole Rowland back in the mix. You know, those three pieces are, are just three of their most important guys. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just that simple. And, and it felt like even, you know, I I know they got swept, you know, we can go to North Carolina, but it felt like they were on the verge of making a run. And uh, I, I think this is going to be a springboard for them. going to Virginia tech and sweeping a good hokey team on the road in a tough place to play. Uh, it's a springboard. Now you got Boston college on the road, but uh, it's BC. You got home against Florida state. Then you're at Notre Dame, uh, and then you you host Clemson. And like you can kind of see it. Like they could win all those series, you know. And then they finish at NC State. Like they could they could run the table. Like I think they're good enough to do it. Yeah. We'll see. I, I'll say this two points real quick on Wake. N- number one, like I I cannot wait to tune in for that Chase Burns versus Florida State's lineup. I just think that's ultra intriguing here in a couple mm, of weeks. Awesome. Uh, the other thing for me too is you know we we've, we've discussed this as a staff of. You know, college baseball last year had Paul Skeens, and I think it's I honestly think it's really good for the game if a team like Wake Forest with Chase Burns and I mean I'll still throw Josh Hartle in the mix and uh, you know Nick Kurtz if a team like that is good and a, a factor at the end of the season I think having a 
having teams with the superstars like that, I think it's important to have them visible uh, in, in the postseason in our sport. And I think, you know, them getting back on track is a good thing. Hey, boys, let me let me throw a comment at you about the ACC. I, I'm just – I'm so impressed with this league this year. I, so here's yeah. my comment. I think the SEC, which is, you know, like that that's undeniably the best league in college baseball. I think to, to say that it's not is kind of a little disingenuous. Yes. However, the gap between leagues is the real argument. And here's the, here's the, the comment I want to make. And I, and I want you guys to feel free to dispute this. I think the gap between the SEC and the ACC right now is the smallest that I can ever remember. Like, I feel like the ACC is right there. Um, and, and I and I think I don't think this is a down year in the SEC. I think it's a normal year in the SEC. But I think the, the ACC really has my attention. Like I don't I don't see a bunch of teams that are beaten up on the bottom half of their league. I see just depth and really good teams that could go that could trade punches with SEC teams in the postseason. Well, the other thing too is so I would I would agree with you. That it's close. The other thing I kind of look at, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago is, you know, we we kind of talked about how the SEC, we thought the top teams in that league were, were better, like clearly better. And, like, I'm not so sure. Like, if you had Clemson versus Arkansas right now and Florida State against A&M, man, I don't, I don't know. I mean, Arkansas not a foregone, really, I mean, It's not a it's foregone tough. conclusion. Yeah. No. And, and not I, at all. You know, and I would Especially say, FSU against A&M. You're right. And I would say, you know, Duke, beside, Duke yeah, out of all the teams so. in the ACC and the SEC – Duke might have the next best pitching, in my opinion. Like just you know the quality of arms and depth and variety of the staff. Yeah. Uh, and then you got North Carolina, who's also very offensive and has uh, a great you know a bullpen they can do stuff with. And they, they lost a tough series to Virginia, who's also good. You know, I, I I don't I'm not in love with the arms there, but you know they got guys and they got certainly a great position player group. And so yeah, I mean all those teams. I I, I kind of feel like Clemson, Wake Forest, North Carolina, Virginia, Duke. Florida State are all kind of in the same bucket for me. I, you know, I know Florida, Clemson has been on this incredible run, and you got to just give them credit. Like they've earned their yeah. spot at the top of that that ladder, no question about it. Long term, who do I think is the best chance? You know, to to make a deep postseason run, a deep deep postseason run. I still might lean toward the teams that have better arms than Clemson. I still don't know if I'm 100 percent in on that pitching. I think I think it's good enough. They can get to Omaha, but. Um, I don't know that they're like way better uh, above the rest of the SEC, ACC rather, just because they're ten and two in the league. I still don't. I, I, again, give them credit; they've earned it. They're number two in the country for a reason. They earned it, absolutely earned it. I'm just saying, like my opinion, down the road, I, I think those teams are all kind of in the same category. Those ACC contenders. Yeah, if this was a year that three, and, and this may, I'm sure this has happened in the past, and I just can't remember it, but if this was a year that three ACC teams showed up in Omaha. That wouldn't shock me at all. Like I, I just think all these teams are super dangerous. Um, and and by the way, Louisville um, sweeps NC State this weekend, right? Like they're um, they just wouldn't let their season die. They now have a freshman Zion Rose hitting third and catching, and I think that makes a big difference for them. Um, anyway, very that league is yeah. Fascinating. Well, I would just say in general, man, like with the Big Twelve just being all over the place, the Pac twelve basically being Oregon State. You know, the other West Coast team, but your other West Coast contender for Omaha basically being one team as of right now in Irvine. I think people better get used to seeing a lot of ACC and SEC in Omaha. Yeah, that's very fair. Hey, so let's great segue, Kendall. So, so off the, the radar a tiny bit, you know, Conference USA had a huge series yep. last weekend. Western Kentucky, you know, Kendall, you were all over it when they hired Mark Reardon. That was, you know, for, he had won national titles at Iowa Western Junior College, which is in Council Bluffs, Iowa. I confused that and said it was in Omaha. Uh, earlier today, it's not in wow. Omaha. It's on across the That's river. That's not as bad as calling Columbia the Bears, but it's pretty bad. <laughs> very, very good. Um, Stitch and I did call Central Arkansas the rail splitters once, but that was that was poorly oh, received. St- Stitch went with that for years. He really tried yeah, to make that it's a so thing. fun. Oh gosh, that's better than the Bears. It is, I think so. But yeah, they, they um, are the Bears, though. Speaking they are the Bears, Bears literally. <laughs> Go on. Hey, so um, Western Kentucky won a series at home against DBU. And that was really interesting. Uh, Louisiana has now won 15 in a row, and they are starting to create separation in the Sun Belt. I also want to call your guys' attention to two other leagues, and then just feel free to take whatever part of this menu you like. The Big East is very interesting to me. UConn is is the program with pedigree. St. John's and, and Creighton are having phenomenal years. I think Xavier's very good. I mean, Xavier was tremendous in the Nashville regional last year. And then the, the colonial um, 
not the colonial, the coastal, the CAA. I just got to call it CAA. Yep. That league is fascinating. And the Northeastern Huskies, it, today is Deke Day, Kendall, but it's about to be Husky Day. So go wherever you want with this, boys. But uh, all those leagues, I let me let me give you a summary thought. I think this, in addition to the ACC, I think this is a great year for non-power conferences to pop an Omaha run. It's right there for the take. Yeah, I mean, and keeping on Louisiana out of the Sun Belt. I mean, Amen. 15 game winning streak. I think the, crazy. The next, I think the next longest winning streak in the country is the, they're f- four or five games ahead of that. It was Ryder going the weekend. I don't know if they swept, but Go Bronx. Uh, you know the Cajuns. You know they were one of those teams that when I saw them in Minimate earlier this year, they really pitched well. I mean, uh, Andrew Herman was excellent. LP Langvin was outstanding. Uh, you know Kyle DeBarge was solid. But the, other than DeBarge and a couple of their guys, they really didn't hit at all. Uh, they've been hitting in conference play. They're hitting 306 in the Sun Belt right now. So that's a dramatic improvement over the offense I saw. And they already had the arms. So, again, I think they're a balanced club. They're, they're a team that I was pretty high on coming the year. And, frankly, the Sun Belt is intriguing. I mean, Southern Miss, I think, you know, you look at the RPI 45, I think they're way better than the RPI I would suggest. You know, you know Rodney Hennon at Georgia Southern, they got up to a little bit of a slow start, but, you know, they beat up on South Carolina. They've been really good the last few weeks. And, of course, Coastal Carolina – um, is a good team, and then and then Troy. Uh, I know Troy's had some ups and downs this year, but sitting at twenty three and eleven, seven and five, you know they're a dangerous team. The second half as well, they're they're way better than, than some of the results would indicate. Yes, Fitzy. Uh, um, so this is hilarious. One of the things I do is this is not the hilarious part. You know, pronunciations are <laughs> are important to me. So I clip, I take screenshots of pronunciation guides in media, you know, in uh, news in uh, uh, the weekly releases for teams. So Lafayette, you know, Louisiana is playing so well that I did this for them. And of course, their pronunciation guide, it's like seven pages, right? Like every name basically uh, for the Raging Cajuns needs phonetic spelling. And so Kendall, I've been calling him L.P. Langevin, the reliever. He's really good, by the way. Just how you said it, right? Little did you and I know he's Canadian. So even though it's no, I know that. Am I still saying his name wrong? Well, yeah, you're saying the way it's spelled. It's it's. Langevin, because he's Canadian. Okay, he's well, Quebec. He's from Quebec. It's Langevin. So, Langevin. so funny story. So I get on a local radio show there. The host, who I know really well, just starts laughing. I think it was Matt Musa, maybe. Just starts laughing his ass off because I'm talking about this dude. At the time, they didn't have him listed as LP. They had him listed as, you know, Louis Felipe or no. Philippe Langevin. Even so better. I get on there like a total like, East Texas clown, and I'm like. <laughs> I'm over there like Lewis, Flip, Philip, Lingman, and he just starts. He just starts laughing. He's like, uh, "Yeah, you're definitely not from around here." Oh god, I so, will say yeah. this: I, I'm going to just try to avoid maybe some some radio down there for a while. That's that's a that's a tough scene, yeah, right Louis, there. Louis, 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 Philippe, Philippe, or Louis Langevin. Philippe Langevin. Langevin. There you go. That's it, Fitzy. You you have to I'm say just it. Call him LPL. Langevin. LPL, yeah, LPL. Oh, that's man. exactly what we need to do. LPL, I am, I am on that train. To my, well to my credit, that's a difficult name to Fre- say. French, if you don't have a pronunciation guy. Fre- French is an outrage. I'm just saying, as far as languages go, like get your <laughs> get, get it together, French. Like your your your, your vowel sounds make no sense. You yeah, got it's, no, pointless consonants. Like get it together. It's the only time I've ever been laughed at by a radio host. It wasn't. Just, it was with me, not at me. Oh, that's great. Oh, that is so good. Fitzy, what did you say? French is an outrage. That is outrage. Oh, so good. Um, Boys, I think, uh, Fitzy, uh, final comment on those kind of off the radar things. Is it it, Northeastern, right? Is it the CAA? Yes. Yes. Please. I I am going to talk about Northeastern because I'm. uh, I'm getting ready to make a little Fitzy special run next week. I'm going to see some some personal personal cheese ball teams, as as, as John Manuel would say. Uh, I got Kansas State playing at UConn on a Tuesday night, and then K State playing at Northeastern on a Wednesday. Uh, wow. I think that's going to be a fun little run. Northeastern is is just like lying in the weeds, guys. I like this. I like this for Northeastern. I would rather them be 24 and seven overall and not in the top 25, and just kind of lying in the weeds. You know, they're going to bite you. They're gonna jump up. Uh, they're gonna make their run. They're they're they're. Mike Sirota needs to get hot. He he's not. Yeah. What's year. what's been the deal with him? When, hitting one thirty six in conference. It's 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 he's just. I don't, I don't know if his pre- yeah. I don't know if his draft draft. Yeah. I just pressing what the books out on him. Maybe I don't. I don't know. I can't I don't imagine he's gonna stick there the rest of the year though. I got to make get, a run. You got to think he's gonna get hot. He's yeah. too good. He's too talented a player. They got a number of guys who really 
um, have that's the thing is they're 24 and seven and they've got some key guys who have kind of underperformed. That's and impressive, so, actually. Yeah, and so I, I, I you know, I, I like their chances to make noise still down the stretch. I still like Wilmington. I talked about them. I think I picked them in for second place at, over Campbell heading into the year. Uh, picked them to make a regional in that league. Um, Wilmington seven and two. Um, in, in conference tied with Northeastern for the best record. Camels are still kind of lurking there. I mean, William and Mary and Charleston both seem like, you know, solid clubs. It's, it's a good Romulan. league. It's, it's a, it's a good league. I, I believe that is the case. Yep. Roots, That's can great. I give you one more league real quick yep. uh, off the wall? Uh, the West coast conference. It's actually really competitive at the top in that conference, man. You got, you know, Portland, by the way, six and oh, but they've done a really nice job. Actually a really intri- intriguing schedule. I think they went to Creighton, they hosted Maryland in Portland. Uh, they played an interesting non-conference schedule. San Diego seven and two. Gonzaga guys, uh, you know, they're one of those teams that have been a consistent winner. They got off to a really slow start, uh, but they're seven and two. And uh, you know, Evie's uh, St. Mary's Club, you know, gave Florida all they could handle on the road a few weeks ago, and they're four and two in the league. So uh, that's an intriguing conference. It's just a wide open title race there. Yep. Speaking of the Portland Pilots, Kendall. This is week nine of the college baseball season. We are past the halfway point, which means that if you don't have your D1 baseball subscription, if you don't have your SEC extra subscription, that needs to happen now. You do not want to go into the second half of the season without your sub to the site. Because if Kendall just, you know, piqued your interest about the Portland Pilots, you could go read my fall report on the Portland Pilots and know mm-hmm. that they finished second in the WCC each of the last two years. This is Jeff Loomis has got it rolling up there in the Pacific Northwest. They're legitimately good. So um, here's what you do when you, you get on the site and you go to checkout, um, you can type in East Texas Clown for some version of a discount. You could also type in French is an outrage. That's another thing that's got a potential <laughs> discount. 24 season, that might get you a discount. Kendall, is that is there a season twenty four? Yeah, uh, 24, 24, season. 24 season. But w- but when you say outrage, it's got to be outrage. Outrage. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Type in LPL. LP. Yeah, that's right. Outstanding. Uh, I'll say the other thing to look out for is now that we've got a lot, the sample size has grown. The DSR rankings, you know, the, the Diamond Sports rankings are up there, and we're going to get into some conversations where there are some real interesting comparisons between RPI and DSR that I think are going to lead to some fascinating conversations about, you know, how do you look at teams and through what lens? And um, I, I'm fired up for those conversations because, you know, I, I, I'm just, I think we all agree. We don't want to, RPI is, it is what it is, but it's a little tired. I'm, I'm excited to have a, a new kid in town, see what it looks like. Yeah. So. And, and we need to kind of figure out how to talk about it because right now it's not an official criteria and the committee is not looking at the DSR, but uh, I, I think we need to we need to make sure that it stays in the forefront, just as as a yeah, comparison yeah, sure. tool, and and because it's it's you know this could be you know this could be an answer certainly that, that it could be it's something we need to look at, and and yeah. we're obviously we're excited about it, but uh but but you know as as we get more data points and we can kind of see the outliers and and how these two formulas treat these different teams, I mean there are already some disparities. We'll get into that I'm sure soon. Uh, on, on our future shows, but uh, it's definitely a talking point heading forward. Yep. Amen. Uh, boys, that was it. Well done. Happy Monday, everybody. We will catch you uh, this this week, Wednesday or Thursday for the preview show. Um, have a great week. That's it. And we will catch you next time on the D1 Baseball Podcast.